This is Will Faber from Art to Ride. We're looking at Catherine Potter's horse, Kip. Looking at his feet here, uh, she said she had some foot problems with him. Well, I can certainly see his feet are kind of broken up there. Um, a couple of things I saw there that, that I wasn't too happy about is the way the back foot is really rounded down to the toe. I like to see the hoof wall come straight down. Uh, looking at his back here, the first thing that I immediately see is the white mark on his withers. And of course, that tells us that somewhere along the line, the horse had a very ill-fitting saddle that was rubbing him raw. And that's what causes the, the hair there. I'm not sure if that's something she smeared on there, if the hair, but of course, that would be something we'd always want to watch out for. He's obviously had a problem there before. Going back over the shoeing, once again, she said he's being corrected. What I saw in the front, I'd ultimately like to see a little more heel support for the horse, but she says she's been having him corrected after a bad shoeing job. So we'll hope that that will improve over time. Um, we can clearly see as she's walking here, you know, he's got a little bit of a dip behind the saddle there, and this horse was a horse that had to be off, I gather, for a while. He actually looked like he had more top line in the previous video that she sent me. And uh, he had to have some time off due to some problems there. So she's getting him back to work, and hopefully that will all uh, start to come back there. But you can clearly see the little dip there behind the saddle there and how he's developing a little bit of a bump there on the top of his hips. Um, a lot of people used to call that a hunter's bump. I call it a bad riding bump. What it means is the horse's stride was not long enough to develop the muscle, the full length of the muscle across his top line. So that's why they developed that high, um, high croup uh, position with that little shortened bump up there. So seeing her once again in the walk... Um, this walk is not too bad. I'd like to see it stretching down more, which I think she's going to be getting him to do here in just a moment. But I like the activity of it. It's quite nice. There he goes. He starts to swing down a little bit more. Still not quite there, but he's coming along, and she's making him active as she goes through that corner there, so that's really nice. And there you see him start to seek the contact with the bridle a little more, and that's all very good. Looks like she's doing a little shoulder four here, and that's all right. You know, once again, you want to keep the amount of angle that the horse can maintain the rhythm. Remember, that's the most important thing. So better to have a less severe angle and a horse that's actually maintaining the rhythm. You're going to get more out of it. Remember, when the horse loses the rhythm, you're losing the gymnastic quality of the exercise. So the rhythm is what we're always following or listening to. Is the horse staying in the same rhythm when we go through these different exercises? Usually we have to add a little more impulsion, a little more energy to the horse a little bit as he comes uh, into a more difficult exercise to maintain the engine, so to speak, revving at that same pace. But here's walk is starting to stretch down. This is looking really good. And of course, my rule of thumb is always that, you know, you should lunge a horse before you ride it if you can't get on it and stretch it down and relax in the walk. But she can clearly do that here, so I'm okay without the lunging. Though I still think lunging is a good... Uh, uh, additive, so to speak, to your work every day, because you can't just keep pressure on the horse's back all the time. You know, once again, you saw how that horse had that white mark on his withers there. Once again, that was from somebody riding him in a very ill-fitting saddle. So just be sure when you're riding that you have a clear channel underneath that saddle. That's something that I can't really see from where I'm going, but be sure there's no pressure. And then, and more importantly, that there's no pad pressure under the saddle. That is, a lot of people will put a pad on a horse and then put the saddle and tighten it down, and then that tightens the pad down on the wither. So always be sure that you pull the pad up in the pommel of the saddle, that there should be a clear channel, not only in the saddle, but of the pad itself, that it's not pulling down on the horse's withers. Now, looking at him coming by there, it looks to me like it could be up a little more. You could have a little clearer channel, but it looks like a pretty light, soft uh, pad that you have on there. But just be aware of that as you go on. Once again, the walk is starting to look a little better here. There he goes like that. That's really nice. That's good. And he starts to seek. And notice how as soon as he stretches down, we start to see a longer, more swinging walk. We see the hind end coming deeper. Watch the overtrack. You'll clearly see as the horse stretches down, the overtrack will become larger, which is what we're always looking for. How deep can we get the back end underneath the horse in just its natural gates? not collection. Remember, collection is once we have a horse developed in working gait, we can then begin to teach him to lower the hind legs, uh, the, hind, the three joints of the hind legs, uh, as I said, to create collection, which is what collection is. It's not pulling a horse's neck back at you with your hands and making them spring their front legs up. That has nothing to do with collection. So once again, she's on a good path here. So doing the right things, he's starting to swing a little more through his back, I like how this walk is getting a little more rhythmic. That's looking much better, though he'd still like to be longer. There you go. Now watch as she stretches the horse as he gets more stretchy and longer and lower. Watch how the muscles change in the neck and the back. You'll see the stride will become longer. She's doing a little shoulder four here, and that's about right. She didn't lose the rhythm, so that's what you'd want to do. Once again, if you get so much angle that the horse may, can't maintain the rhythm of the gait, then you know you, you're asking the horse too much for its level of development. 
You can see even how he, when his head comes up, how the walk becomes more halting. He kind of pulls up through the shoulder instead of reaching out and swinging through the shoulder. But she keeps going back to that when she lives. That's exactly what we have to do all the time. You know, horses are, are not automatons. We don't just place them in a thing, a uh, frame, so to speak, and they stay there. That's kind of that old idea of saddle seat riding and Tennessee walkers and all these kind of artificial gated horses that, you know, remember, you, you create artificial gates by hollowing the back of the horse. That's why you see so many of those old, you know, uh, most saddlebreds go lame very early and they're mostly all completely sway back. That's how you create an artificial gate. You ruin the horse's natural gates, which is something that, you know, no one who ever really cared about their horse would want to do. So getting started here at the walk, I still want to see a deeper walk. I still haven't seen the walk I want to see get consistent yet with this. And once again, with a horse like this, I do very little stopping. You know, with young horses, I usually stop them, you know, once at the end of the session, and that's about it. Because the more we stop horses at this level, if they're not strong enough to really keep their backs out uh, up underneath them, all that's going to happen is they're just going to fall apart when you try to halt. So it's not a very useful exercise for horses that we are trying to develop, or even older horses. When I see riders that are constantly stopping, 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 and when they're doing it, they're usually pressing their seats down into the saddle, which actually hollows the back of the horse even more. When you halt, remember, you should stretch up. You have to lighten your seat in the saddle so the horse can continue to track up underneath it. Now, this walk is looking much better now, starting to swing better, though the neck is kind of shortening back a little bit, but I still want to see a little bit longer. But she may have to do that for a moment in order to just get him to soften and get him out into the more like the walk that she wants. He's looking better all the time, but still, once again, we want to see him swinging a little bit more and get him stretching into that contact a little more. We still haven't quite found that place where he's just staying consistent over his top line. So he needs a little more activity here, making him a little more active. And once again, stretching your body up, being sure that you're carrying your weight as much as you can yourself by keeping your posture correct so the horse doesn't have to carry all of your weight because you're sinking down too much into the saddle. She's going to do some leg yields here for us now. Not bad. Now, remember, I would like to see you put your outside leg back a little more. I suggest you go to my video on uh, how to use the outside leg, the secrets of uh, dressage. Check that video out where I talk. You must bring the outside leg back from the hip. Any, whenever the horse is bent, your outside leg should be back from the hip. That's the hardest thing in all of riding to achieve. Very few riders I see do it, and it also is... Once you learn how to keep your outside leg back correctly, it so helps you to create a channel that you're flowing the horse through. Um, if your outside leg is forward, you're not controlling the hindquarters in the way that you should be, nor is your inside weight on your inside seat bone. So if you just practice that for a minute, try that, bring your outside leg back from the hip and not from the knee, you'll see how the inside seat bone is weighed. So that's what I'd like to see you more at this point. And from now on, as I tell every rider, this is the hardest thing you'll ever work on is the correct position of the outside leg. So as you come around there and you start to go into a leg yield, your outside leg should go back. Now, many times we see people, uh, I'm not sure what she's doing here. This looks like a little bit of a half pass. Now, I would have liked to have seen a better leg yield before we went to the half pass. Now, it's a half pass because she's moving into the direction of the bend. But his head came up and, his, and the gait got rather short. So I would like to see better leg yields right now. I'm not really not interested in seeing you do half passes yet. I want to see a good leg yield and a good shoulder in where the horse doesn't shorten the neck or slow the gate down. So once again here, it looks like she's trying to do, unless she's just confused about what she's doing there, but this is kind of halfway there and not really either or. So um, we want to see a clear bend a little bit to the left. Remember that the leg yield is nothing but a preliminary exercise to the shoulder in. You have to do a leg yield before you can do a shoulder in. And of course the leg yield is the most basic exercise. Good. Now the walk is really good now. That's what I want to see. That's starting to look like a better walk. And that big long walk is where I'd like to see you do these exercises. So once again, I don't think this horse is ready to do half passes. I would stick strictly to the leg yields and the shoulder ins for right now until you, when, once your shoulder ins become a little better and you actually see the bend. Remember, the only difference between a shoulder in and a leg yield is that in, in the uh, shoulder in, the horse must clearly show bend over the entire length of its body, um, not just in its neck, let me point out. And not as some horses do, it's kind of cocking their, their uh, hindquarters to the inside. We want to see a bend that is the full length of the body, no more in the neck ever than in the middle of the body. 
So just to reiterate here that once again, she looks like she's trying to do half pass as she's trying to move into the direction. But see how short the horse, see how he can barely move the hind leg around the other hind leg, that is the right hind leg around the left, because he's simply not engaged enough to do half pass. So let's get half pass out of your repertoire for a little while until we get the uh, walk work better in both the shoulder ends and the leg yields. So, of course, in the shoulder in, we just have to get the horse listening a little more to the outside rein. It has to yield the shoulders to the rein while it listens to the leg, moving it sideways. So, in a leg yield, all we're asking the horse to do is to move sideways. But we want to keep our leg in the middle of the horse. I see a lot of people do leg yields and have been taught to do leg yields by pulling their inside leg back, where they're really just pushing the hindquarters over, which tends to make the hindquarters lead the exercise. Remember, in the leg yield, the shoulder must always lead the exercise. This is a looking a little better walk, though I still want to see the neck out longer. The horse is, once you shorten him up there, he's breaking a little bit back in the neck and, and could break, uh, that is, he should flex a little better at the pole rather than back there in the neck a little bit. He looks a little too soft there. So once again, it looks like she's doing half passes here again. But once again, see how difficult it is? The horse really can't cross through. He's not engaged enough to do this exercise. So I just want to see leg yields. And if you don't know the difference, uh, between a leg yield and a, and a half pass. The half pass, we move into the direction of the bend, as you were trying to do there. In the leg yield, we move away from the direction of the bend. In the shoulder in, we move away from the direction of the bend. For instance, if you were going to do shoulder in down this next long side, you would be bent to the right, but you're moving to the left. So I want to see a much better um, shoulder in. Now, this is getting a little better here. She's got, she's asking for a little more here, so he's got a little wider angle. But once again, look how he's bringing, he's kind of pulling his pole up and neck back. So we need to work, though the rhythm is not bad here, but we need to work for a much longer neck out so he doesn't shorten the neck and pull it back at you. So that's why I would suggest doing a lot more leg yields for a while. I mean, if you can't get the leg yield for the neck to stay out there in the leg yield, then it's probably not really a good idea to go into the shoulder in because he's just going to shorten back at you. So I'd like to see much more work at the leg yield until you can really get the horse to step through with the shoulder slightly leading the exercise. Once again, if you need to go back and look at my uh, video on how to do leg yields on there, and uh, that will give you some information. So we hear, see how this half pass has become really kind of valueless for the horse as he's kind of pulled his head up. Of course, that has nothing to do with what he's doing now. But you can see how the gait becomes, came, became shorter and shorter. Same thing here. He's not really swinging in the walk. So this exercise is really not having any value for him because it's, he's slowed down behind, looks very kind of ponderous with his back steps, like he's pulling his feet out of mud. He's not really swinging any longer. So once again, I want you to get the horse back out there. There, like that. Now, when you get him out there, look how much better his walk is. So what we need to do is be able to get this horse so you can go through these lateral movements with the neck out long and swinging and taking the contact in a longer frame than you're doing here being able to maintain that rhythm. So I love it when you finally let him down there. He meets much more work there. Don't be in a hurry to bring him up. The way you really ought to train is we can teach horses everything in a long frame while they develop the strength for collection. Then once we can begin to work on the collection after the horse is, is developed through the top line, then what we can see is we'll have a good rhythm and a big length of step. You know, if you don't have one of these million dollar horses that has such fabulous gaits that it kind of still looks good no matter what you're doing, which most of us don't have those kind of horses, and, you know, and once again, people get confused because they kind of try to follow the riding of the kind of people who ride, who have these fabulous horses, but they're still hollow and they're just moving their legs. Well, this horse is never going to move like that. So you must get him moving as well as you can and develop and, and, and then you'll be able to compete against those million dollar horses. Once again, same here. The neck was just still too high. You could see how the, it was, the gait was kind of um, very haltingly, kind of a little bit jerking his head up with each step. So once again, much longer. There's the rhythm out there with a little longer frame, and then go into your shoulder ends and leg yields without losing that rhythm. Now that's a little better that time, but see, once again, it kind of slows down, and there's like a lurchiness. You know, his head pops up every time he takes a step. Well, that tells me that he's not strong enough to do this exercise with his head up in that position and stay flexed and over his back. That's why you're seeing the jerkiness as he pulls his head up each time you do that. So you need to go back and, and study the leg yield a lot more and getting much more fluent and staying in a longer frame. You do a good job of getting him there, but you're just bringing him up too much for his level of development. We want the neck to stay out, but that's soft through the jaw and pole so that we don't lose the rhythm. So once again, we need to do much more of that correct walk work. I'll just reiterate what I said there. I want you to get him working in the leg yields in a really long frame so you can keep him stretching out there in front of you before you start doing shoulder ends and stay away from the half pass for a while until you can really get a much more fluid uh, movement in the walk there. 
Going into a trot here, this is nice. He's rising to the trot. I'd like to see him out. He's, that's not bad at all. He's actually better over his back here at the trot. And that's often the case. You know, very often you got it's actually the walk is the hardest gait really to ride, even though it doesn't seem like it to people because you're not moving. But you really have to take your time. As Nuno Oliveira used to say, the walk is where we explain everything to the horse, you know. So we must be sure that that's really happening and uh, that we're really taking our time and getting it right. Now, when you're coming to the trot here, once again, your trot work is better than the walk work and that he's moving better in the trot than he was in the walk. Once again, I'd like to see him stretch down, little counter flexion there coming through that corner. But once again, just like in the walk work, I want to get him in a longer frame, stretching into the contact and then maintaining it. That's better there as he starts to seek the contact down. And once again, whenever we're looking at horses, we want to look, you know, don't just look at the head. Look at what, look what the effect of the head and neck position is having on the hind legs. That's what we all must do all the time. Too many people are only look at the horse's face, you know, and that's all beginners or inexperienced people tend to look at. They tend to look at the whole body of the horse and how fabulous it is and, and that head and neck position. But it's really the back end that you need to look at all the time. That's what's really telling the whole story of whatever the head and neck may be doing. But that's a pretty good working trot there. You see how she comes across there and he kind of pulls up and loses it for a minute. I'd still like to see him working in a deeper frame here like that. That's more That's more like where he needs to be right there. And you can see how the track, once again, the over track is much greater when he's there. There, like that. We would not want his pole to come up higher than that. That's about where he can be comfortable. There, good, like that. Now he's seeking the contact nicely. He could even go down a little more in the stretch, but this is good. And the trot looks pretty good. Very nice, right there. That's quite nice, though. Once again, it could be a little bit longer through the neck, but that's really much, much, much better, like that. I'd like to see you send him on just a little more actively, so there's just a little bigger, bigger swing in the trot. Remember, we're always looking. Now, that's lovely, right there. That's where you want him to be. Now, notice how all of a sudden, when he stretched down like that, the hocks begin to flex more. That is, we see more flexion in the hock now. That's a clear difference in what we started with. You know, we all must work on that all the time. You know, the back end, um, watch my video on educating the rider's eye. That's a big, fabulous horse, but you can really clearly see the difference between when it's correct and what it does to the horse's, the movement of the horse's hock. It should look like I said, like a person bicycling when you see those hocks, a nice round circle in the hock like that. That's better there, like that. That's where we want to keep him. So once again, you know, we're only getting real value for our time when the horse is working over its back. So to do anything but that is just a waste of your time and a waste of the horse's legs. Because once again, whenever the horse is not connected over its top line, you're putting all the pressure of the, the, of the movement is going into the hard tissue of the joints instead of into the soft tissue of the joint. Once again, you see when he pulls his head up, how the hock becomes flatter. That is, it moves in the hind legs move straighter without so much flexion in the hock. That's better there. Getting his head out nicely there. That's much better. Better. This is a more active trot. I like this, but he still needs to be able to see that. Watch the difference between what happens with the lower part of the neck and how fat it is when he when he comes up. That tells you he's hollowing. When you see him like that, you can clearly see the top line lit up. That's what you're looking for. And consistency. Now, same thing here in the rising trot. We must learn to get our outside leg back. So whenever the horse is bent, the horse shoe should be in, in right or left diagonal position. That means your outside shoulder forward and your outside leg back. It's a bit like patting your stomach and rubbing your head at the same time. But it is the most important thing about the horse's about the rider's position, other than being stretched up and supporting your weight, is once you can do that, we need to start working on the outside leg, getting it back so we have a clearer channel to send the horse down. Now, once again, notice how be much better, the lo lower she gets his head and neck, the better the hind end looks. That's pretty good activity there. We'd still like to see him a little bit lower with the neck. Once again, you see there how he kind of, the bottom of the neck becomes uh, convex, that it sticks out. Once. So we want to see it. when that becomes soft. You see the bottom of the neck becomes soft like that. So deeper into the stretch here. I love the fact that you're sticking to the rising trot. That's all you should be doing on this horse right now. There, now you're starting to get him working over his back much better. You can still go a little bit deeper yet. That's really good.
Very nice there. Now that's about the best I've seen his working trot look here as we've gone along. There. She gets him to stretch all the way deep into the contact. That's what I'm looking for. Now, by virtue of the fact that his neck stayed a little flatter that time, she got a little bit of start of a pretty good shoulder in there because he didn't just jerk his head up when she went into the movement. There, that's a nice working trot for him right there. Good, that's good, like this. That's the nicest he's looked so far. That's really quite good. Notice how soft the underside of the neck looks. Look how consistent the gait is. And she comes back and even stretches him deeper, I hope, here. Was once again remembering the hierarchy of the movements. That's really good, right there. Now look how good that horse looks right there. The whole top line looks consistently lit up. All the way across, that's really good. He can swing. And once again, notice how rhythmic this is starting to become. That's really good. And I like how she made that downwards transition. She took her time. She didn't just plop herself into the saddle and slam the horse you know, onto the brake. So that's really good. But once again, as soon as you come back to the walk, I want to see that stretch. Back in the trot here again. Once again, you can see how he's a little hollow there. The head is a little too high. Look at the difference in how he's moving. See how the back end, the hock, isn't making that nice round circle. Starting to get a little better there, once again, but look how high head it is. So again, notice how the head and neck position changes what happens at the back end. That's what people have to start looking at. You know, if you have a horse's head up and all flexed over and the back end is not moving, that's not good. Or in the other case of like people who are rollcurring horses, you'll notice the horses will never be relaxed. They're always nervous and they become nervous wrecks. That's why we see so many of the people, including the, the world's biggest exponents of this, you know, they can't even halt their horses. You know, we see it and we've heard this in the limp, you know, over as, as an excuse by these rollcur people over the last few years. Oh, well, it's so exciting at the Olympics and things like that. These horses can't stand still. Well, the horse that won the last Olympics certainly showed that it can be done and that just because a horse is Grand Prix, it shouldn't be a nervous wreck. I mean, if it is, in fact, that pretty much shows us how wrong the whole training has been of the horse. A Grand Prix horse should be completely relaxed. Impulsion is not nervous energy. That's what people have to get out of the idea of. Impulsion is really an expression by the horse of its level of physical conditioning that results in the horse springing off the ground and having that kind of supple energy, like an athlete at the peak of his performance who's, who's ready to go, but he's not tense. Tension kills everything. Any other kind of sport, if you're tense, try to shoot a basketball with your arms tense. It doesn't work. You know, you can't, you can't make a... Uh, um, a willing participant out of a slave, you know, which is what we see with these people who are rollcurring horses and pulling their heads down with draw reins and all these things. They're just browbeating the horse into submission. But they'll never really have the right kind of brilliance where the horse is relaxed. That's what true brilliance is, and that's what true impulsion is. Once again, it's that sense of the horse's expression of its level of physical conditioning, not a nervous wreck. Now, this is looking really good. Once again, look how active he is behind now. That's really good. And he was stretching into that contact very well. Really good. Once again, once once in a while he gives a little swish of the tail. He tells me he's a little unhappy about something. Might just be the spur or her leg or something touching him. But for the most part, he's staying quite relaxed, and that's what tells us a lot about it. He obviously doesn't like so maybe sometimes you're pulling your leg back a little far, and that's what's causing that. But once again, also the neck, see the neck is shortening up and back again. So just keep trying to get it out there longer through all these exercises. You should be able to do shoulder ends and leg yields with the horse in the trot completely all the way down in the stretch. Once again, as I say, we can teach all these different exercises while we let the horse work in the frame that it can then when it develops enough strength to collection then the horse knows everything but we don't have to be collected to do them we just have to be consistently working the horse over its back and then as it learns collection just comes as a very natural process of the horse's conditioning when it gets strong enough in other words it can now this is looking really good and once again, we've talked about Catherine's weight here a little bit. She's doing a really good job if she is trying to uh, lose all that. And we're going to see that over the next year, I'm hoping to see. But she does a very good job of, even though she's a little on the overweight side, she's maintaining herself, her position, because she's stretching up so much, the horse is able to deal with her weight. You know, which is the, the, the biggest difficulty for a lot of horses when people who are a little heavy get on them. Of course, they can't hold themselves up, so they collapse through the back of the horse. But Catherine's doing a wonderful job here with this. 
This is looking quite nice. It, I'd like to see him stretch once again a little, little deeper, but she has seems to have the feel for when he's right. She keeps getting him there. So once again, the only thing that was wrong here is you're trying to do in like in the walk some exercise that he wasn't ready to do. So once again, in the walk, just um, just leg yields and shoulder ends. There, look how lovely that looks. That's where I want to see him. Now I'd like to get to the point where you can basically get on him and get this frame as your goal and then be able to work your 20, 25 minutes in this frame. There, that's excellent. Just like that. That's really well done. And once again, you know, she's there working by herself and just learning this on her own with my help over the video. So she's doing a wonderful job proving that there's no excuse for anybody not doing this correctly with their horse if they're willing to take the time to learn a little bit and are patient enough to wait for the horse to develop. That's what I see wrong with, you know, with most people today is that most people are simply not patient enough. They want everything instantly. Well, you simply can't have horses instantly correctly trained. It doesn't work that way, nor can like, nor can you educate anything else or a human being overnight and suddenly force them to do these things. So this is ending up in a really good place. I couldn't be happier with where this horse is ending up. That's a good working. That's as high as his pole should be. So I would call that right there. This horse is working trot. Look how consistent it is in the bridle right there. That he should pole should not be any higher than that. So you worked from that Get your leg yields, once again, in the rising trot only, no sitting trot on this horse at all. That's another missed, uh, misnomer is that so many people think if you're not sitting to the trot that you're not doing dressage. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, very often people who are sitting to trot are not doing dressage whatsoever because they're really just hollowing the back of the horse and overworking the back of the horse. This is what leads to horses getting things like that big white spot we saw on this horse's withers. That's from some ill-fitting Ill saddle or someone just kept riding, even though the horse was probably bleeding at the withers every day, but they just ignored it. You know, it's... Uh, all of those things are indications, you know, and, and that's a good thing to look at. When I go to look at a horse, I immediately look at the withers and things like that and see if there's a lot of white hairs there, see if there's been, you know, injuries to the horse in the past. So this is good. She's come back to the walk now, and we're getting a better walk and a more stretching walk. Could be swinging a little more active there, but she seems to know that, and she's sending him right back on. So that's a really good job. Now, once again, that to me would have been a mistake there. While you got him into the canter, he kind of threw himself into it, and then he hollowed against your back. Um, I would like to see you at this level go through the gears. That is, you do walk, you do trot. Then from the trot, you go to the canter, because I don't think he's really strong enough. While you were able to get some sort of strike off, you know, it took you, it was a hollow one, and then you, it took you a while, and now the canter's pretty good. So if you'd started the trot from uh, started the canter from the trot you wouldn't have had that problem you would have been able to make a better transition without him swinging up so we ought to be sure that the horse is consistent before we worry about how consistent the horse is in its position between the gates we have to be sure the horse can just be consistent in the gates themselves which this horse is getting to and then simply not not skip a gear like you did there so at this horse's level i'd like to see you do walk and then trot and then into the canter I and mean, if you want to come back to the walk after your trot work, that's fine for a little bit to get the horse a breather. And that was quite a nice downward transition. You know, she didn't go into a sitting trot. She made it. He didn't move his head. He didn't throw his head up in the air. So that was a better downward transition because she went back into the gear she should have gone into and right back into the stretch. And that was the right amount of canter for the horse at this level. You know, you got to remember that trotting builds muscle and cantering tends to build wind. So a horse at this level who doesn't, who we need to develop its top line, we want to be sure that we're spending most of the va that quality time in the trot and just a little bit of the canter as you did there that was good once he got in it he stretched quite nicely for you i'd like to see him stretch even down more in the canter but once again we don't worry about the transitions being perfect and that was good that time even though you can see even in the trot he still had to throw his head up a little bit so he's not consistent enough we simply wouldn't worry about that once the horse becomes really consistent in the three gates they will be able to maintain that position all of a sudden that head tossing will just go away all by itself if you've done the rest of the work correctly as the horse gets strong enough to make that and with a horse like this at this level I wouldn't even canter it every day. I, I don't think he doesn't look like a horse that needs to canter a lot, though though he you get him there quite nicely in the canter. But you might just canter every few days. And once again, when you do that, you'll see the canter will improve and all those transitions will just get better and better. Once again, we improve the canter by trotting, not by endlessly cantering. Cantering will just get, the course will just get worse and worse and more tired out. So 
But he is strong enough to canter. He could obviously stay over his back with you, and that's really good. Look how she's coming back to the trot and back to the stretch after that exercise. So it isn't stretching is not something we only do at the first and at the end. We have to do it throughout. Whenever you feel that the horse is tiring, you have to become sensitive to that and let him do what he needs to do. That is to stretch back out. Then he won't become anxious with you, and he won't become uh, sour to the gates. So once again, this has been Will Favor from Art to Ride with our scholarship student, Catherine Potter, and her horse, Cass. She's really doing a wonderful job job and I expect to see great things out of her over this year uh, of her scholarship. This is a very nice job. She's ending in a very good place. Got a little hollow right there. Once again, watch that. Watch what it, what it does to the back end of the horse when he comes up. That was a nice transition back to walk. She took her time. Her seat didn't come into the sat saddle until he got all the way there into the walk and then she sat down softly on his back. Now we're at I, I probably would have stopped there, but she's going on and doing a little more stretch. So that's all right. Just like that. Once again, those downwards transitions aren't real valuable for the horse at this level yet, but he did that quite nicely. It wasn't bad. And there, that was even a better transition to walk. Even she kind of lost his back. You can see how when she sat down, all of a sudden he lost his back end, considering what, the, what your weight does to the back of the horse. That's a good example. All right, look forward to seeing more of Catherine in the very near future. She's doing a wonderful job with this horse. And a wonderful job on her video editing, I will have to say. <laughs> Great job.